Does that cord go with you? Yeah, we're going to find out. <laughs> I'm going to try and be still. All right, cool. There we go. I think this is working okay. So, what's going on, guys? Okay. All right. Yeah, it looks like it's coming through all right. Everybody in the class has gotten the notification. Cool deal. Hey, guys. Hey, guys out there on Facebook. Guys in, uh, in person here, welcome. Thank you. Thank you again for coming out and hanging out. Uh, I do appreciate it. We got a little chance to chit-chat before we went live, so uh, caught up with everybody. But all you guys out there on Facebook, you guys know the drill. Uh, you know, we'll give it a few minutes. Make sure you get, get logged on. Make sure I can see you. Go ahead and drop a comment or something in the, uh, in the box there. Let me know that you can hear me. Let me know you can see me. You know how this works by now. Uh, hope everybody had a good week. I know it was hot, really, really hot. So, uh, you know, I didn't do much but go to work and go home this whole week. I did manage to mow the grass yesterday, though, which was less fun than it could have been. Um, but, yeah, we just want to give everybody a chance to go ahead and get logged on. Um, again, if you didn't see my invite, you know, we got some guys here in person with me, so we do invite you to come hang out with them. They're not too scary. At least some of them aren't anyway. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Looking at you. Looking at you. Uh, <laughs> well, cool deal. Let's see. If I can see comments here, I think we can. Uh, all right, cool deal. Looks like we're good. So, yeah, go ahead and drop me a comment if you can see this and let me know everything's coming through all right. All right. Well, with that being said, I titled this one Modified. And I think you guys here in the room have probably seen this slide before. Um, like I'd done with the last one, I changed quite a bit of them. In fact, I added, I think, uh, 11 to this uh, and took out a few and just changed it around from when I did this the first time. It was over a year ago that I actually uh, did this the first time. So if some of this looks a little familiar, then I apologize. But to the guys out there on Facebook and, uh, and to everybody that might watch this later on, this will be totally new. But you guys have seen some of these. But I think it was changed enough to make it worth doing again. So with that being said, everybody's familiar with this slide by now. <clears throat> As I said uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, uh, the pastor did ask that we would, uh, we would open our small groups with, with prayer uh, for everything that's going on in this country today, you know, with unrest and with COVID and with reopening, don't reopen, get together, don't get together, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we, just, we just really need to just kind of stop, pray about it, and, uh, and let God just kind of do what he's going to do with it. So with that being said, I'd like to open with prayer before we get started today. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father. Uh, we come to you today just thankful for the time that we do get to spend together. Father, we know that you have a plan, and Father, that your, your ways are higher than our ways, and we don't have to understand what it is that you're doing, Father. We just pray that you would give us the, the strength to, uh, to trust in you and that your will would be done through each and everything that is on this list. Father, we know that um, there are many, many other needs other than what's just uh, written down here, but you know those needs, Father, because you know us you know, better than anyone else in the world, as Pastor said this morning. Father, we just pray that you would be with each and every uh, person that may be struggling right now with their faith or with their health. And Father, we want to send a special prayer to all of our police, firefighters, first responders, and, and military veterans, both uh, current and past. Father, we just, uh, we got a special place in our heart for all of those guys and girls. So we just pray that you would be with each and every one of them as they, uh, as they deal with this, you know, on, on an even harder basis than we do. Father, we do all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good deal. Good deal. Appreciate you guys for that. So, yeah, just, uh, you know, in your prayers out there, uh, you know, during the week or during the day or whatever, just try to keep, keep these things in mind because, you know, we can't do anything about anything that's going on. So let's just pray that, that God can. Uh, so cool. Also, got a little housekeeping going on here. No class next Sunday, August 2nd. So mark your calendars there. Uh, we're having the start of Vacation Bible School here at Tanglewood. Uh, so we have no class uh, for that Sunday. And then Sunday, September 6th for Labor Day weekend. So hopefully everybody goes out and has a safe and, uh, and, and fun Labor Day. Uh, I myself is going to be heading to the mountains for camping that weekend. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully it won't be 150 degrees. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, but, yeah, just wanted to make sure that, you know, we didn't get this announcement out that we're not going to be having class next weekend or the 6th. So enjoy your time off. I know I will. So, you know, hopefully uh, you guys get out and do something fun. All right. Looks like we got some folks uh, joining us online here. Chris, Jack, Zach Barfield, Kevin Thornton. Kevin Thornton, man, haven't, uh, haven't talked to you in a long time. Good to, good to see you on here, buddy. I hope you hang out with us. Zach, you know Kevin. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, 
So cool. Well, let's get started. So what is uh, one of the things that you could look at this car right here and say that it has been modified? What well, 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 won't be a dead giveaway. Yeah, I mean, it is an old Mustang, and they do come from the factory pretty awesome, but not quite that awesome. <laughs> uh, so what, what would you say, Cliff? What, what was first windshield. first giveaway? <laughs> windshield, that's pretty good. Yeah, spoiler. <laughs> uh, spoiler. yeah, yeah, spoiler, the front uh, splitter, tires. tires and wheels, yeah. Uh, the hood scoop, that's a good call. Uh, I guess you could probably say paint scheme, even though it's kind of hard to see. It's got some circles and some you know, uh, stickers and stuff on it. Uh, but that's pretty easy. You can look at that car, the way it sits, right? It's lowered, um, you know, the headlights and things like that. But you can look at that car and pretty quickly say, that car has been modified. That car is not stock. And, uh, and that's one of the things I want to talk about today. So that's going to be our kind of tie-in today. We're going to talk about modification, but also we're going to talk about, you know, people. That, you know, you can pick out a modified car in a split second. You can hear it, you can see it, you know, it can go by you in, you know, in two seconds and you could tell right away that that car has been modified in some way. The wheels, the tires, the way it sits, the exhaust, the way it sounds, whatever the case is, uh, you can tell. Well, we want to talk about, you know, us as people, you know, it should be that easy for people to recognize us as being modified as well. Um, you know, I think that, you know, if we're, we're modified in Christ, if, if we've got the Holy Spirit in us, it should be that easy for people to pick out <coughs> that we've been modified as well. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit more. But first, we got some more pictures of cool cars. So muscle cars, no matter if, you know, you're into that thing. There you go. There's one for the Chevy guys. Yeah, yeah. Got to, got to give one up. Got to give one up for the Chevy guys. And, you know, nobody can argue with that. I mean, <laughs> first-gen Camaro slammed down on big giant wheels and tires. You can't beat it. So I'm with you. Imports, this is, uh, this is near and dear to my heart, personally. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a RA21 Celica. I actually had one of these. Uh, I had a white one. It didn't look nearly that cool, even though I thought it did when I was driving it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that, that is a really cool car. It's an old Toyota Celica. Uh, Time Attack 370Z. Again, I had to include the imports. That's near and dear to my heart. Anybody who knows me knows that. Uh, but also trucks, you know. Folks are into trucks. I'm not really a truck guy myself, but hey, it's hard to argue with that. Yeah, I kind of dig it, man. I, I don't like know. Rims. Yeah, I'll give you that. The re the wheels are a little funny. So, uh, the body's nice, but the rims suck. The color, the color. Yeah, yeah I'm about the color. Um, yeah, the real, yeah, the wheels match, I guess. I don't know if I would have went with that kind of yellowish uh, yeah, look to it. Yeah. Um, I've showed the folks online here, <laughs> but and there you go. Some people there are some people are more into this style of truck. Uh, again, that's. Uh, that's the man size. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, again, you know, I'm not, not really a huge off-road, four-wheel drive, big truck guy. I never really have been. But if you're going to do a rock crawler or you're going to do an off-road truck, it'd be hard to beat, uh, you know, doing it that way. I got to admit, that thing looks like it's been done, done up pretty right. Uh, but like we said in the beginning, the thing you could notice from all of those cars, muscle cars, imports, or trucks, you could tell right away all those cars are modified, right? I mean, none of those look stock. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. <clears throat> so this is, a, this is another picture I took at a racetrack, actually. But just as it is easy to notice a modified car or truck, it should be also be easy to notice a person who has had their spirit modified in Christ. We should strive to live in such a way that those around us would notice our heart for God and his people. That's kind of strong words, right? I mean, I got to admit, um, you know, I've... I've said it to you guys before a hundred times. Uh, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. I'm, you know, that's, that's not who I am. Uh, in fact, I've just spun wrenches for about 21 years and, you know, not been a very good guy for a lot of those. Um, but when you, when you think about it this way, I mean, it is, it is tough. But also, I look back over the last, I don't know, five or ten years. And David, I think you would agree you know, maybe we're not where we could be, but we're definitely we're, closer we we're definitely closer than we were, uh, and that's that's a hundred percent the truth. I mean, that's the truth for me too. I mean, I I'll, I'll be a hundred percent honest with you guys out there on Facebook. I've already told these guys, uh, you know, I don't listen to music that maybe you would think. I don't, you know, sometimes use perfect language, um, you know, smoke cigarettes, and I like to drink beers, and you know, and all those things that you do when you're young, but, uh, but over the last few years, things have gotten a lot better, and so hopefully one day I'll get to that level where it's a little more well, obvious. If you look at it, it's 
it says they notice our heart for God and his people. That is a fantastic point, David, and that's exactly the point I hope to get across. Um, you know, a pastor had a fantastic sermon this morning. Uh, he really hit the nail on the head about how Jesus surrounded himself with, with misfits, you know, with folks that weren't necessarily... Right. <laughs> yeah, they, the people that Jesus surrounded himself with weren't necessarily, you know, the cream of the crop or the, uh, the upper crust, if you will. Uh, you know, they were, they were some rough and ragged, you know, rough around the edges kind of guys, and, uh, but their heart was in the right place. And I think David hit the nail on the head right there. He couldn't have said it better. They, we need to have a heart for God and his people. So that being said, let's get into our verses for this evening. So what we modify, what do we modify on our cars? And, you know, we're going to talk about what we modify on us. So on our cars, you know, we like to modify wheels and tires, the engine type and size, you know, put, a, put an LS in it, right? Isn't that the answer for everything? This is on the Internet, so I have to say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, we modify the exhaust, brakes, suspension, paint and bodywork, uh, seats, belts, and steering wheel, you know, safety items. Um, you know, especially if you're doing any kind of racing or anything. Electronics, you know, even if you're not into racing or anything, you might put a DVD player or some kind of fancy sound system or whatever. And transmission and drive axles, you know. Uh, I think Zach can speak for all of us when we say, you know, automatic to manual swap or uh, five-speed to six-speed swap or in my car, four-speed to five-speed or whatever the case is. But, yeah, you know, change drive axles, change differential in the ratio, or the ratio in the differential, change the axles up, especially if you're doing that rock crawling stuff or big trucks or whatever. Um, so, yeah, we, we modify quite a bit on our cars, and we'll talk about why we do it in just a second. But let's talk about modifying us, modifying our heart. So Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and perfect will. Uh, and one of the things I like most about this scripture, actually, is that not only is it saying don't conform to the patterns of this world, which I think everybody here has probably heard, uh, and it also says be transformed by the renewing, and I like to maybe flip-flop, you know, modifying of your mind. Uh, but it, I like this word right here, then. So you do these things first, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and perfect will. So I think that's pretty cool that, you know, you can, uh, you can actually have a renewing of your mind. You can have a modification in your heart. Then you'll be able to test and approve, you know, then at that point. So I think it's cool that there's kind of an order there, you know. You don't have to be all perfect first, you know. I, th I think the perfection comes later on. Uh, oh, man, Pastor Stocks is, uh, is logged on here. Oh, wow. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. I hope you get to watch some of this. Uh, cool deal. Well, that makes me, uh, yeah, that makes me extremely nervous. <laughs> that, that's, there's no secret there. Uh, our next one, 2 Timothy 2, uh, 15 and 16. So do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. That is another strong scripture. In fact, we've had kind of a rash of strong ones lately, but uh, as I've said to you guys before, 90% of this is talking to me uh, when I put these things together. It's what I need to work on. It's you know what, what's, in, what's kind of convicting me at the time. So uh, this, this really kind of hit me pretty hard. But I also really like what it says. It says, be one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So that's probably something the world could use a little bit of today, uh, correctly handling the word of truth, right? I mean, if something is true, it's hard to argue with. So I'm sure you'll find plenty of people who will try to argue with you. <laughs> uh, you know, I've always been one of the guys that like to say, I, you know, I, I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. Uh, and, you know, if I know it to be fact, then, hey, you know, we can go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. But if I don't know, I'll step back and say, all right, I don't know. You know, maybe you can show me. What are the facts? What are, you know, prove it. Um, but I think that's, that's something that a lot of folks struggle with, and, and that's something that we could all do a little better. But it's definitely something that the world as a whole could do better is uh, correctly handle the word of truth. And then avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. This one I'm guilty of as well. Um, Godless chatter, gossip, basically things that aren't pleasing to God, things that aren't, uh, you know, giving glory to Jesus. Uh, you know, basically it could be anything. I mean, we all kind of have those, uh, 
those moments. But when it says those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly, I think that's an easy trap to fall into. Because you could be having a really nice, let's call it discussion with someone, and it falls into a, you know, and it falls totally into a screaming match or cursing them out or them cursing you out or whatever the case is, but it could easily devolve into that. And, uh, and then you can see right there where it says it will become more and more ungodly. So the longer it goes on, the more it happens, you know, and then all of a sudden you, you both hate each other and, you know, that's not, a, that's not a good deal. So it's just saying avoid it altogether. So, you know, if it's not good and pleasing to God, if it's not bringing glory to Jesus, then just try and avoid it. Um, that's easier said than done, but hey, you know, hopefully, hopefully you guys out there will, will get that. So now we talk about, that was what we modify. We modify our hearts. But why do we modify? So this is super cool right here. I think we can all get on board with that. GM guys, Ford guys, import guys, truck guys. I don't think anybody's going to say that's not cool. <laughs> so uh, zoom in on that so they can see. Um, but why we modify? We modify for more power, of course, right? Like, you know, everybody likes more power. I don't think anyone's ever bought a car and brought it back to the dealership and was like, hey, could you give this a little less power? Yeah, just, just knock it down a little bit. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's ever been the case. <laughs> uh, better handling, you know, that's, that's a big one for me. You know, everybody knows I like road racing, so handling, of course, is a, is a big deal. Aerodynamics, appearance, off-road capability, on-track performance, uh, comfort and entertainment, and safety. So these are kind of the reasons that we change the things that we talked about earlier. So, you know, we change the engine, we change the wheels and tires, we change the suspension, we change the paint and the bodywork, and we do all these things, and this is kind of why we do it. Now, obviously, you're not doing all of that on one car. I mean, I don't know any one car that would have off-road capability and comfort entertainment and on-track performance, right? <laughs> but this is kind of what we're, uh, why we do it. And so our scripture for why we modify, uh, I've got two of them again, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your, of your uh, excuse me, with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So it's not hard to see where the modification tie-in comes in that scripture, right? I mean, it says, you know, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self so you're changed, you know, you're being modified, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So this is another one just saying, you know, it's possible that through Christ we're changed, we're modified. So I like that one a lot, but I like this one a lot too. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. That's, uh, that's another one of those scriptures that's, yeah, that one can be a little tough sometimes, right? I mean, you know, forgive someone who's uh, had a grievance against you, uh, you know, put on humility, gentleness, patience, uh, I don't know if, uh, <laughs> Sam, I don't know if you're out there watching today, but, you know, humility, you, uh, you like to lecture me on that a lot, so I'm, I'm trying to get better. <laughs> but, uh, oh, it says, over all of these put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity, which is very interesting because we've heard a lot of that, right? The world needs love. We need to love one another, and that is 100% the truth. And this, this verse right here is even saying that it is over all of the rest of these. Uh, so that should give you some idea as the importance that, um, that the Scripture puts on that. So... Again, with everything going on in the world and everything that's going on right now, I think this is probably a good, uh, a really good scripture for, for this time and this day. So take it to heart, I hope. Um, like I said, when I put these together, I usually use scriptures that hit me the hardest and hope that somebody, one of you guys in here, would, uh, would get something out of it. So with that being said, we'll get into our lesson. Failure equals opportunity. Who's heard that before? You ever heard that uh, in the shop? I... Uh, I had a service manager, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the automotive, in the tech world, uh, one of the worst things you can have is a comeback, right? You know, you tell the customer, hey, this is going to fix your car, and it's going to be X number of dollars, and they say, okay, you go ahead and do it, and you do the work, and you get paid, and you send the car out, and that sucker comes back with the same problem, right? That's, that's the, the ultimate sin in, in what I do. 
Uh, now, sometimes there's a, uh, you know, ever since you worked on it customer, which, you know, <laughs> that's not the same thing. Uh, yeah, those, those folks just, you know, like to be hard sometimes. But comebacks are definitely, definitely not, not acceptable. And I had, a, uh, I had a service manager used to tell me all the time, you know, there's never time to do it right, but there's always time to do it twice. And, uh, you know, he's basically saying that, you know, you, you didn't do it right the first time because you were in a hurry. But when it comes back, you got to do it again. And so suddenly there's more time because now you got to do it. Uh, and then Sam, he likes to tell me right now that every, every comeback is a, just a second opportunity. And thank God that we don't get very many. But it does happen because we are imperfect people in an imperfect world working on imperfect cars. So, you know. <laughs> but failure equals opportunity. They are one and the same. Our vehicles, just like ourselves, are prone to failure in different ways and at different times. Every failure of a component or system in our car, whether caused by wear over time, outside forces, improper maintenance, is an opportunity to upgrade or modify. In our personal lives, we can use failures or shortcomings as an opportunity to turn to God for modification. Like modifying our vehicles, the goal is to be made better and stronger in our faith through the power of Christ's ability to modify our hearts. So, does that make sense to you guys? Yes? I wrote that, actually, and uh, I was kind of proud of that, so I hope that makes sense to somebody. <laughs> but I hope, that, I hope that's coming across uh, to you guys online as well. Looks like we got some more joiners, too. So, uh, Ann, Eddie, good to see you guys on there. Uh, again, you know, we'll take a break right here just to say, I do try to check these live as we're doing this, so please post up any questions or comments. And uh, I know there's like a 30 or 45 second delay, but uh, I will get to them as soon as possible because I really like to try and keep this interactive. The guys here in the class, you know, I love to interact with them. That's one of the reasons that we switch to this kind of hybrid uh, classroom deal because it's a lot easier for me and it's a lot more enjoyable for me to have somebody in the class that I can kind of interact with than just doing it on the camera. But I didn't want to, <clears throat> I didn't want to alienate all the folks out there that were watching online either. So we tried to do this hybrid thing, and it's it's a little distracting sometimes, but I think it'll be all right. So, that being said, <clears throat> let's get into our modifications. As I said in the last slide, failure or replacement is the perfect opportunity for modification, right? Something is already broke, something has already failed, and, you know, why, uh, why replace it with the same part? You know, Carol Smith said that uh, there's no greater sin to replace a broken part with one just like it. Uh, so we want to try and upgrade whenever we have to replace parts anyway. And wheels and tires are one of the biggest ones and probably one of the first ones that should be made if you're thinking about modifying a car of any kind. You know, sports car, muscle car, truck, whatever it is, wheels and tires are going to make or break it, uh, you know, pretty much all, all the time. It's going to make or break the way it looks. It's going to make, the, make or break the way it handles, the way it, you know, the way it rides, the, whatever the purpose it was designed to do, drag racing, road racing, rock crawling, whatever. Wheels and tires are going to play a huge part in that. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that. This car right here is one of the Ring Brothers cars, and I don't know that there's a muscle car out there with a better stance than that. I mean, to me, that's, that's just perfection. Um, it just sits right. It's got the right amount of tire on it. It's just, that thing just looks good to me. But for you truck guys, you know, that's pretty cool too. I mean, you know, when it comes to stance, <laughs> yeah, you know, we can do this, you know. You yeah, does that help? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, whether you're into cars or trucks, you can see where the wheels and tires make, make or break that stance. I mean, look at it. You know, if it had some stock wheels and tires on it, it would look ridiculous. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's kind of the point we're trying to get across. And we're making wheel and tire selection. One of the biggest deals is backspacing or offset. It's the same thing, just said two different ways. Uh, so if we're looking at our, our rims we've got over here, let me make sure I zoom in on that because that might be a little hard to see for the guys online. Uh, you can see right here, and I hope you guys can see this, this yellow is the, is the wheel face. That's the actual, you know, center part of the wheel. Uh, and then you see it's more centered here, and then it's kind of more toward the back on this side. So right here you can see where the mounting surface is pushed really far forward. That's a lot of back spacing or very little offset. You know, that's, that offset from the front to the mounting surface is very small, but the back space from the back of the wheel to the mounting surface is very big. And then you see where the mounting surface is more centered in the wheel, zero offset. 
you know, it's the same on both sides from the mounting surface to the inside and mounting surface to the outside. And then negative offset, this is the cool one, you know, for everybody watching at home. <laughs> this is when you get a lot of dish in the wheel, uh, negative offset. So it's actually negative. The mounting surface is pushed toward the rear of the wheel from the front. So you can see if this is the, the front of the wheel, it's really dished. And then there's very little back spacing. There's little space between this and the back of the wheel. And this, you can see the same width, the same size wheel would actually sit in three different places on that car. So if this is the mounting surface, you can see that most of the wheel is tucked inside the car under the body. In this one, it's kind of split 50-50. And in this one, you can see the wheel would actually go out toward the outside of the car. And you would end up with a, you know, more dish and less, less tire under the car. This is extremely important when you're talking about modifications because this is going to set how wide the wheel is, where it sits in the car, does it clear the fenders, or you know, do you even want it to clear the fenders? Because, you know, probably not. We want the fender to be like right there, <laughs> ideally. <Total. Total. laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, that's what it makes sawzalls for, right? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you definitely want to take in um, offset or backspacing, depending on how you want to word it. If you're talking about the back of the wheel, from the the rear of the wheel to the center of the. Uh, or to the back of the mounting surface, that would be backspacing. If you're talking about the front of the wheel inward, it's offset. But it's the same measurement, just taken from a different side of the wheel. And here's another kind of a bigger version of that. It's, they add a whole lot more complex uh, measurements and things on this, on this uh, diagram. But you can actually see the same thing. So if this is your wheel, picture this wheel cut in half. There's your mounting pad. There's the face of your wheel. And then you can see where it sits in or out from center is, you know, the amount of offset is how far that is from center line. So you hear wheels talk about, you know, a negative 10 or negative 20 offset. That's, that's usually in millimeters. And you see the center line of the wheel, and then you see the mounting surface is actually pushed toward the back. So that would be negative offset. And then if it's pushed this way, that would be positive offset. So that's, uh, if you're ever buying wheels or if you're ever pricing them or anything, that's what they're talking about when they're talking about offset and backspacing. Wheel construction or material, another really important part of uh, if you're going to if you're going to talk modifications, if you're going to talk about changing your wheels or tires or wheels in this instance, uh, most everything now uses aluminum wheels. There are some stuff out there with steel wheels, and the offset and backspacing and all that still applies. But most everything uses aluminum wheels, and if you're buying custom wheels, they're probably going to be aluminum. Uh, but there's two very different very different processes for making these. Cast aluminum allows for inexpensively producing a relatively light wheel with complex shapes. So this is a cast aluminum wheel. Uh, it's lighter than steel wheels, though the porosity in the casting usually reduces the wheel's strength. So this is a, you know, standard cast wheel like you'd see on any OE car, you know, like a, I think that one's from like a Caravan or a Stratus or something, I don't know, some Chrysler. Um, but it's, it's literally cast aluminum. They melt aluminum, pour it into a mold, and they get this shape. Uh, they can get much more complex shapes than you can with steel, obviously, because it's easier to just melt aluminum and pour it into a mold than it is to try and stamp steel into some kind of crazy shape. But you do lose some strength. You know, steel wheels are stronger, uh, usually. Not always the case, but usually they're a stronger wheel, but they're much, much heavier. And the deal with wheels is it's unsprung weight. It's weight that is not supported by the suspension. Uh, so anytime you're talking about sprung weight or unsprung weight, Anything not supported by the suspension of the car is unsprung weight. And anything you can do to lighten up that unsprung weight will make the car turn in better. It will make it brake faster. It will give it better fuel economy. It's going, to make, it's going to be better performance all the way around by reducing unsprung weight. So aluminum wheels get an advantage over the steel wheels in that, in that regard. But the forged wheels, this is where things get really nice. This is a set of BBS LMs that I dream about on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a really good reason why I don't have them. <laughs> Actually, lots and lots of American reasons why I don't have them. <laughs> but they're forged aluminum. And the biggest difference between uh, cast and forged is that with the forged aluminum, they actually, they actually force or forge the, the aluminum in, into a mold under lots and lots of pressure. They actually pound that aluminum into, into a billet. Uh, and then a lot of times, you know, they can be forged into the shape, but a lot of times they're forged into a billet and then machined into a shape uh, is usually the case. But either way, it's a forging. They actually press on it with a lot of heat, a lot of pressure. Uh, and what that does is it, it compacts all that aluminum. There's no porosity. It compacts all the, you know, 
crystals, if you will, or molecules, or whatever you want to call them, uh, in the aluminum makes it much, much stiffer wheel and makes it much lighter uh, because they can actually use less aluminum to kind of squeeze into that, that spot. Uh, they're the highest strength wheel while keeping weight to a minimum, and the forging process is complex and requires highly specialized tooling resulting in a very expensive product. And that's why I don't have some EBS LMs. Uh, but they are typically three times stronger and 25% lighter than cast aluminum wheels. And that, that would be probably half as light as a steel wheel. Uh, you know, they've got some forged aluminum wheels that run like seven to nine pounds a wheel. I mean, it's crazy how light they can get them. Uh, but yeah, that again goes into reducing unsprung weight. So any, anything you can do to reduce weight on the corners is, is a good thing. But again, just want to kind of keep that in mind. So if you're, you are talking about modifying the wheels, you're talking about different, uh, different offsets and different backspacing, but also you got forged or cast. These BBLMs right here are probably, uh, I think they're like $840 a piece when I looked at them. And you could pick up a set of cast wheels for, you know, 200 bucks for all of them. <laughs> you know, I've seen some that did have forged barrels. These particular ones, these uh, BBLMs, they're actually two-piece wheels. So the barrel is actually spun aluminum. It's actually spun on a lathe and then they, they attach the inside uh, later. So that's even more complex than a typical forged wheel. Something like a TE-37 or a, a Watanabe or something like that would be, would be just forged with the barrel and all. These multi-piece wheels are super sweet, though, because, you know, we're talking about offset and backspacing, and you can order them in any width and any offset in any, any backspacing because they can move the center section in and out uh, when they build the wheel. This, something like this, once it's cast, it's cast. You know, you, you can't, you can repair it, I guess, in some cases, although I don't know. There's, there's some debate about that. Uh, if they develop a crack or, or if you damage one on a curb or something, generally they can't be structurally repaired. They can be cosmetically repaired. You know, if you get scratches on it or whatever, they can weld it. Usually if they're cracked, they're cracked. That's, that's just it. Because welding on cast aluminum is a tough deal, especially in a structural setting. So, uh, yeah, these can be repaired and they can be rebarreled and things like that. But again, like I said, these are like two or 300 bucks a set and these are like 800 bucks a piece. So, yep. you know. <laughs> Jack Cage says, my BBS barrels are crazy light. Yeah, super jealous. <laughs> BBS makes some good wheels. All right. I included this chart in the handout material, so I'm not going to go over this whole thing, uh, you know, here. But this is a really cool offset versus uh, backspace chart. So we were talking about, you know, how one is in relation to the other. Uh, and if you download the handout materials, there's a full-size version of this in there. But that just goes wheels from five and a half inches to 12 inches in width, and then it shows you the uh, backspacing here. So if you got an eight inch wheel with five inches of backspacing, you know, that's a uh, plus 12 offset. So that mounting surface will be 12 millimeters toward the outside of the, uh, of the wheel, you know, to the outside from the center line. Same way, you know, we get into the good stuff over here, you know, nine inch wheels, three and a half inch backspace, negative 36. Yeah, that's, that's the good stuff. <laughs> that's 36 millimeters back. So you'd have 36 millimeters more dish on the front of the wheel. That's, that's when they look cool. <laughs> Not that I'm biased or anything. Uh, <laughs> again, I put this up here. This is probably a little too basic for most of the people that are in this class. Uh, you know, but I just wanted to put it up there because you never know. I mean, you guys here all know this, I'm sure. And you guys watching online probably know this as well. But when it comes to wheels and tires, you know, it's very, 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 very important that they be torqued correctly. Uh, here's a little bit of a range talking about from 12 millimeter studs, little tiny studs, all the way up to 5 8 uh, studs, and what the torque range generally is. So this is a really good guide if... Uh, 10 bolts. <laughs> yeah, 10 bolts now. There's nobody here manly enough to handle 10 bolt wheels like you, David. <laughs> if you got more than six, then I don't want to work on it. <laughs> uh, this is a really good, a really good gauge. If you don't know the torque, you know, if you're just guessing, or if you've got a car that you're not sure about, or you don't know where the uh, where to get those specs from, uh, you can use this as kind of a gauge: 12 millimeter, 75 to 85 foot pounds, and then all the way up to 9 sixteenths, you know, 105 to 115. So. Somewhere in this range is going to be pretty good for, for most everything that you're going to deal with. Uh, it's always good to go by manufacturer specs, of course. If you've got different hubs or whatever on it, they may have different lug studs. So you want to try and get the specs from them. But that's a really good place to start if you don't know. That's, torquing it to one of these, you know, based on your stud diameter would be better than not torquing it at all. So 
definitely, definitely, definitely keep that in mind. And always do it in the correct pattern, which, again, I think all you guys out there know. So we'll skip that one for now. Tires. This is the most important modification and probably the best bang for your buck that you could do to any car. I don't care what it is. You know, grandma's grocery getter, your mud-eating truck, little sports car, whatever the case is, tires are going to make it or break it. Uh, cannot stress that enough. So it would do you no good at all just to make 700 horsepower and spend $4,000 on paint and $10,000 on wheels and all this other stuff and put junk tires on it. I don't care what you're building. You know, like I said, if you're building a rock crawler, you're building a road racer, whatever, drag racer, it doesn't matter. Tires are going to make or break it. Uh, that's the only thing contacting the road on your car. You've probably heard that before. Like I said, you could have $100,000 in your car. The only thing connecting it to the road are these four pieces of rubber. And usually the contact patch is less than about the size of a dollar bill. So there's not a whole lot holding that sucker on the road. Don't skimp on your tires. Uh, they usually are rated in UTG or U2... <laughs> UTQG. I messed that all up. No, that's not some kind of rally or whatever that's going on in New York. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that is a uniform tire quality rating, usually in the range of 100 to over 500. You usually see these printed on the side of a tire. It'll say UTQG uh, right there on it. Uh, and you'll see a number, you know, 660, 440, 180, whatever the case is, you'll see a number. The lower the UTQG, generally the stickier the tire. A tire rated at 400 would typically wear four times longer than a 100. Anybody know where you would want a 100? Because I sell tires and I want you to buy more of them. No, because, the, because it's going to be stickier. It's going to be more grip. The compound that they make the tire out of is going to, going to stick to the road better. The consequence of that is it's going to wear faster. There's just no way around it. Uh, I like to give my dad a hard time. I don't know if he's watching tonight, but he used to be the guy that would walk into a tire shop and say, give me the cheapest thing with the highest miles, you know, and then you'd come out with Fred Flintstone cement tires, you know, that wear the asphalt more than they wear the rubber, you know, and they would last a long time, but they didn't ride good. They didn't handle good. They made a ton of noise. They just, they, they didn't do anything really well as far as tires go, but they lasted a long time. So that's usually where you get the high the high UTQGs is usually in cheaper, harder tires. Now, if you're running, you know, big trucks and you're towing a big load and you need like 10 ply tires or something like that, it, you know, obviously you'd want something a little higher. But uh, just keep that in mind that the lower it is, the stickier it will be, but the higher it's going to wear. So it's always a compromise. Uh, these are actually my tires right here. Uh, that's picture is quite a few years old because these tires are slicker than it's not on a doorknob right now. Uh, but, <laughs> and they got that way in about 8,500 miles, <laughs> but they were very, very expensive, or uh, very, very, well, they were expensive, but very, very sticky. <laughs> uh, these are BFG uh, Rivals, uh, 225, 45, 15 size, and those are UTQGs of 200, uh, which at the time was all that was allowed in the class that I was racing in. But they make them even lower than this. I think Zach's got 180s on his car. Uh, I've seen them as low as 90 for, you know, road race tires and things like that. But that's generally not what you want on the street. Something over 200, you know, 300 to 400 is probably what your average street car is going to use. You know, um, anything over that, they get really, really hard. So keep that in mind. They're also rated in traction and temperature rating, uh, A, B, or C. And double A, A, B, and C are traction ratings in terms of G-forces. So that's how many G-forces that, that tire is capable of producing. Double uh, A obviously being the being the best and C being average, although I would say less than average. Uh, so just keep that in mind when you are buying tires. So we talked about your wheels, we talked about your tires. So again, don't skimp on the tires. Uh, even if you bought cheap knockoff wheels, like I did, uh, <laughs> don't don't buy cheap tires. <laughs> While we're on the subject of tires, one ninety five fifty five sixteen. Can anybody tell me how, what what that means? You know, does that make sense to anyone? <laughs> so you see this a lot um they call this you know metric tire sizing or whatever you want to call it but this is generally how tires are sized and 195 is the first number that's the width in millimeters so that's going to be how wide the tread is in millimeters so 205 245 315 that is how wide the tire is across the tread the second number is the aspect ratio that is a percentage so 
described as the aspect ratio, this mark represents the height of the tire sidewall as a percentage of the width. Sounds kind of crazy, but if you had a 200 mill, uh, millimeter wide tire and a section width of 50, so let's say you had a 250, then that would be 50% of 200. So that means that the sidewall will be 100 millimeters tall. That would be a pretty, pretty tall tire. It would be like a truck tire. Uh, so generally, the higher this number, the wider it is, and the lower this number, the lower profile it is. So that kind of gives you an idea. You know, if you, need, if you say, well, I need a 10 inch wide tire, you know, that's roughly 250 millimeters. So it'd be like 255 or 245, somewhere around there. And then you could get the height based on that. And that will really get you dialed in as far as, you know, how big and how wide they can fit or how wide you need. Um, but that's just something that I think everybody should, uh, that's just some information everybody should have. And then R, of course, is radial. And a lot of people think that stands for rim. That it yeah, actually stands for radial, radial construction. Bias ply tires don't have that. But I don't think bias ply tires. Bias anymore. Yeah, maybe some drag slicks or something, or road race. You know, I think there are some drag slicks out there, but they don't size them like this. Those are usually sized like 31, 10, 50, you know, or something like that. Uh, and then, of course, the, the last number is the rim diameter. So 16, that, that's for a 16-inch rim. If that were 18 before 18-inch rim, you know, 15, 22, whatever the case is, uh, is, is the rim diameter. So I just wanted to kind of include that in there while we were talking about tires. And tire inflation, huge, huge, huge deal. These are my, uh, my very, very, very terrible attempt at making some graphics here and drawing something on the computer, but you guys get the point. Under inflation is going to give you slow response, higher tire wear, uh, especially on the edges, and they run hot. They actually heat up the tire quite a bit more. Overinflation is going to be poor ride quality, decreased braking and handling, and high wear in the center of the tire. So you can see this is kind of a crude representation of a tire that, you know, be kind, I drew that. Um, <laughs> Question. Yes. When you get cars in your shop, yes. you do the tire work, how do, you, how do you air them up, I mean, as far as... Oh, how much do you put in them? There's always, always, always... A label inside the car, usually. Right. <laughs> do you go by that, or do you go by the cold on the tire? There? I was going to skim right say that. So there's always a maximum pressure on the tire, but that's the maximum pressure, like David said, cold. Uh, and as tires heat up, obviously air expands, and so the pressure increases. So you don't want to run them at the maximum on the tire, like you're talking about. Now. Every manufacturer since at least the early 90s, maybe even before that, has a recommended tire pressure, usually a sticker right inside the door of the car. Um, you know, obviously you're going to put them to that unless you're doing something like, you know, running on the beach where you'll lower them down or autocrossing where you might, you know, run them up. But for the average street car, you'd run them to factory specs. As David was talking about, they do have something printed on the side of the tire that says a max pressure. So it might say max 44 PSI or max you know, 65 or whatever the case is. <clears throat> and I'll usually run them about 10 pounds below that is, is generally where I like to start. Where do you put them? Well, like the ones on, like on my truck, mine say 44 cold, so I normally run them about 40, 42 because of the heat that build up. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to have a blowout the hotter the tire gets. It is, but like on those ones, if it says max was 44, that's... That's pretty pretty high. I would probably run those down quite a bit. But well, see, I've noticed too. Another thing though is because I've had they when I had them put on, they had them at like thirty two, thirty five. Yeah, that's probably and, where I would uh, put them. Yeah. I noticed I had a lot of yeah, play. yeah, yeah. And this is why you know right here, slower response. You know, you actually get a lot of flex in the sidewall mm -hmm. with lower air pressure, and you probably notice decrease in miles per gallon. So you're giving up a little bit of uh, wear in order to have better response and better fuel economy. So uh, by running them up higher, you are going to get better handling, but you are going to wear them faster. So it's going to be a trade-off. Uh, and on your truck in particular, you know, ride quality is kind of not a priority. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, uh, you'd probably get a little better ride if you were to lower them down a little bit. But again, you're going to give up some of that steering feel. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. But uh, for running them at 44 is probably pretty high for those tires. So, I don't know, 35 is where I would start with those. But here's how you can find the Optum. 
I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what if you don't know how much air you should put in the tire and you're not sure, you know, what the tire, what the manufacturer specs are or anything else. So how can we find out, you know, well, what would be the perfect tire pressure for what we're doing? Well, this is an old autocrosser's trick right here. This is something that race car drivers do all the time, but you can use this on your street car as well. You take a chalk mark and you actually run it across the sidewall of the tire you know, in a couple of places, make sure you get a good mark. And you want to go down the sidewall a little bit, you want to go onto the tread a little bit, but you want to make sure you get that corner, you know, marked. So the ideal pressure will be achieved when the chalk line is rubbed off to the tip of the triangle on the sidewall. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. Increasing pressure will move the line toward the center of the tire, so going up on it will actually move the line, you know, this way. And decreasing it will move the line more onto the sidewall, or it will lower it. All tires, at least all that I've ever seen, I, I know this is going on the internet, somebody will connect, correct me later, but every tire that I've ever dealt with has a triangle molded into it, or it has several of them around the sidewall, usually right about there, right about where the, uh, where the lettering and stuff stops, there's usually a little triangle or a little mark. Well, if you mark that with the chalk like we're talking about here, and you go out and you do whatever it is you're going to do. If you're drag racing it, if you're autocrossing it, if you're rock crawling, if you're doing whatever, you're, you're driving it just on the street, you will get a wear pattern where that chalk wears off. And you want that chalk to wear off right at the tip of that triangle. And that's going to give you the maximum effectiveness of that tire. It's going to be the, the most even wear, it's going to be the most grip, and it's going to be not running over onto the sidewall, and it's not going to be giving up, you know, it's not going to be keeping this part of the tire from even touching the ground because it's so overinflated. So that's the way to find the ideal tire pressure. And, you know, this changes. So let's say that you had a big, heavy toolbox in the back of your truck all the time. Or, you know, you change some, some sort of weight distribution. You put a different engine in the car. Now weight distribution is different. Well, with the more weight on the car, obviously, tire pressure is going to change. And so you can actually use this to find out the perfect tire pressure front to rear as well. So try that out if you're not sure. And see if it, uh, see where you come up with. But I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> so suspension modifications. This is, uh, this is also another fun one. This is another one, what, you know, like we talked about before. Most of these modifications we're talking about, obviously we're not talking about every kind of modification uh, on every car, but we're talking about things that you replace anyway. You're going to replace tires anyway. You know, you're going to have to replace suspension components anyway. Uh, so this is all things that are really good to do, uh, you know, when something fails, when you have to replace it anyway. And this is one of the best ones because, you know, shocks wear out, springs wear out, although not often, bushings, that kind of thing. So handling upgrades, stiffer springs, high quality dampers, chassis stiffening braces, lighter and stiffer sway bars, suspension bushing material and steering ratio and angle changes. Uh, you drift guys out there will like that one. That's, that's, that's for you. Uh, but generally... You know, we're talking about wore out struts and wore out bushings. So, you know, you got a car, 60, 80, 90,000 miles. It's time to replace the struts anyway. They may be making some noise. Maybe they leak. Maybe it just doesn't ride as good as it used to. Perfect opportunity to upgrade. Uh, because, you know, again, cars are built to a price. Even expensive cars are built to a price. Uh, and I just went to that too fast, but that's okay. Um, and so, you know, they're not going to put the best of the best on there, but while you've got them off and while you're making that change anyway, it's a really good time to do, go ahead and do that. One of those options is cool over struts, again, uh, generally better like valve to control larger tire and wheel uh, packages. So, you know, if you do change the tire and wheel, you change the weight, you change the grip, you change the amount of uh, rotating uh, force that you put on the suspension. So you definitely want to take shocks into account when you do that, especially with the big trucks. Uh, usually allow for greater suspension adjustments with a high degree of movement. So you get a lot more adjustment when you do an alignment with these. So you can do a performance alignment, uh, you know, or you can align it for whatever it is that you're doing with the vehicle. But this gives you a whole lot more options as far as that goes. And allows for ride height adjustments for better appearance, tire clearance, and or aerodynamic advantages. Let's face it, it's for appearance. You slam the car down to the ground because it looks cool. <laughs> uh, but also you can pick it up for tire clearance. Uh, or if you really are, you know, doing some sort of racing with it or some sort of autocrossing or anything like that, you know, you, there could be an aerodynamic advantage like in a drag car to put it nose down, you know, something like that. Uh, so, yeah, it just gives you that option to adjust it, to move it around. These have come down in price a lot in the past 10 years. You know, when I was, well, 
<laughs> I was going to say 10 years ago, I was still kind of old. So 10 years before that, <laughs> 20 years ago when I first got my license, these things were outrageously expensive, but they've come down a lot now. So, you know, that may be, a, may be an option to consider. Bushings are another one. Bushings wear out. It's just what happens. They're made out of rubber generally, uh, and they get hot, oil soaked, you know, they get abused, whatever the case is, they just wear out. Well, the, I thought this was a really cool slide, and I included this in the handout materials for tonight too, uh, of some common bushing failure symptoms. So if you hear these things or see these things, you know, it might be time to start looking at some suspension bushings. Uh, metal to metal rubbing sounds. <clears throat> A vague, <laughs> a vague drifting feeling from the steering wheel when turning. Uh, that may just mean that you drive an old GM truck. You know, I don't know. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, or, you know, I got to pick on Ford a little bit here too, man. Those daggone Ford boxes, you know, like the old F-150s. Oh, those things are terrible. It's like trying to drive a tractor down the road. Uh, so, yeah, I got to pick on them too. Uh, abnormal creaking noises when accelerating or braking. Vibrations from the front of the car, usually worse when accelerating. That's typical front-wheel drive motor mount failure right there. Uh, see that a lot on front-wheel drive stuff. You take off and the motor mount is wore out, so it rocks back and picks up on the axles and you get a, get a big shake. Uh, clunking noise when driving along an uneven surface. Uh, and premature and or uneven tire wear. So you can actually get tire wear problems because it won't hold an alignment. No matter how many times you get it aligned, if you got wore out bushings the first time you drive it, it's going to pull it into whatever angle it wants it to be, and you can actually end up with uh, ruining your brand new set of tires. So keep those things in mind. When we're talking about bushings, this is what we're talking about. Any place that there's movement in the suspension, generally any place that there's movement relative uh, to the body in a, in, a, in a suspension component, there's going to be a bushing. Mo very rarely, I mean, some race cars and stuff will have metal to metal, but most of the time there's going to be a bushing of some kind. Uh, and, you know, in this case, you got inners, shock absorbers, outers. Uh, they've got this secondary control arm, and then they got the trailing arm. I don't know what this picture came from. It looks like some sort of BMW diagram because it's got a whole bunch of links and whatnot. But most all modern cars, you know, have some version of this. So anywhere that there's any movement relative to the car with the suspension, there's going to be a bushing of some kind. And that is an excellent opportunity to upgrade. Here's a really good example of what we're talking about. OEM rubber bushings, excessive body roll and shift. The problem, rubber bushings allow unwanted movement and flexibility in the suspension, making the car lean more and drive with less precision. So you see this example, I thought this was a really good illustration of the, of the rubber being actually flexed. And so this, this control arm mount right here is actually moving relative to the center of it. Well, polyurethane, you know, or Delrin in some extreme cases, but most of the time polyurethane this is a perfect opportunity to upgrade. So if your car's got old rubber bushings in it and they've probably been in there, you know, since the beginning of time and they're old and dry rotted and oil soaked and cracked up and all of that and they gotta be replaced anyway, it's a really good time to go ahead and upgrade them with uh, Delrin, poly or uh, polyurethane rather. They uh, stiffen the linking points in the car suspension, reducing slop and therefore adding to the car's responsiveness and feel on the road. There is a downside though. With the polyurethane bushings, you are going to have increased road noise, increased vibrations, and increased harshness. So there's always a price to pay, just like everything in, in we talk about with these cars. There's usually a compromise of some kind. And the compromise with the, uh, with the polyurethane bushings is that you are going to end up with more noise. The reason they use rubber bushings in OE cars is to make them quiet and soft. But, you know, you are going to get lifetime. They don't rot. They don't dry rot. They don't wear out generally. I mean you know, not, not in any reasonable amount of time. You are going to get enhanced road feel. It's going to handle and be much more responsive, a whole lot tighter on the road, uh, enhanced performance. Uh, squeaking, though, there is a squeaking opportunity because with the old rubber bushings, they actually don't slide. They just flex in the center. You actually just end up with a flex. So with polyurethane bushings, generally they're allowed to slide inside their mount. Uh, so there is an opportunity for squeaking there, and you do have to re-grease these. They say every four to five years, I do it every year on my car. I put the whole polyurethane set on it, and I've uh, been doing it every year, so it's not a huge deal. But they are easier to install. Anybody here ever tried to press in control arm bushings? I know you guys online have probably had to do that. Uh, that can be a huge pain in the neck to get in and out. Usually it requires a torch and a press, and, you know, 
some not nice words and <laughs> and some co coaxing and coercing, but with polyurethane ones, generally they just, uh, you grease them up, you slip them in and everything's good to go. You don't have to press these in. So it's a whole lot, whole lot easier to install if you're doing it on your own. But if you do have wore out bushings anyway, I would highly recommend doing this. It makes a huge difference in the way the car feels. But again, there is a price to pay. All right, we're getting to the end here. Ah, I just want to take a moment to uh, look at that. That is beautiful. Okay, now we're back. <laughs> uh, I had to include the GT3 RS in there somehow, right? Uh, and what better way than the exhaust? Because, you know, this is probably one of the best sounding cars there is on the planet. Uh, if you ever get a chance to hear one, it just sounds, it sounds like the end of the world. Um, I don't care if you're a muscle car guy or not. These things sound awesome. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about exhaust upgrades. This is another really good, a really good time that you could address a failure with an upgrade. So... The exhaust system is heavy and ugly and prone to rust and rattles and just all kinds of bad news comes from the exhaust. It has to live in a harsh environment. It's under the car. It's hot. It's getting sprayed with salt and water and dead raccoons and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, so the exhaust lives a rough life. So if you do have to replace the exhaust anyway, it's a good idea to go ahead and, and, and try and lean toward an upgrade. So what would an upgrade look like? Higher flow rates support higher horsepower output. Notice I didn't say higher flow rates make more horsepower. Sometimes they can. You know, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you can pick up some horsepower by changing the exhaust. Generally, if you don't do anything to the motor, it's not going to make any more power. It's just going to be louder and look cool. But it can support higher horsepower. That's the, that's the key. So if you, uh, you know, if you do down the road add a turbo or nitrous or a bigger motor or do whatever you do to make more power, the exhaust will be able to handle it. But with a factory system, the flow is so restricted that that's not the case. So I was very careful to word that. Uh, they're lighter weight from advanced alloys. So generally they're lighter weight. You know, they even go all the way up to being titanium in some cases. Um, but most of the time they're stainless steel or aluminized steel uh, in aftermarket applications and better heat dissipation. So they actually, you know, can cool the floor of the car yeah, a little bit better because they do dissipate heat faster. But you can see in these two pictures here how complex the factory system is. There's secondary catalytic converters. There's an X pipe here. Uh, they got these big giant mufflers that you know aren't straight through. They're the kind of pathway style mufflers. In a lot of cars, there'd be some secondary resonators as well, uh, either on the tips or somewhere back here. And then you got the aftermarket system, which is just nice and clean, nice and straight through with some straight through mufflers, and it looks like a stainless system as well. So that would last forever. It's not gonna rust, and it's not gonna rot, it's not gonna rattle, uh, and it, you know, you might pick up a couple more horsepower, but it would sound super cool and open up the opportunity to make more horsepower later. So <coughs> again, if you already gotta replace it, you might as well make it better. This, we're not gonna go over this whole graph. I included this in the handout materials as well. This is a really good chart showing horsepower, uh, per pipe diameter. So basically, you know, how big a pipe do you need? You know, you're making 290 horsepower with two pipes, you know, two two-inch pipes are fine. Uh, if you were making, you know, 566 horsepower, anybody in here making that? No? Yeah? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> Zach, 566 horsepower E36? That'd be like... <laughs> uh, you would need, you know, two three and a quarter pipes or one uh, let's see, single maximum uh, 468 horsepower, you need one three and a half inch pipe. <laughs> that would look, you know, pretty funny. Look probably like a diesel truck or something. Uh, but yeah, you can see right here, two three and a half inch pipes supporting up to 935 horsepower based on CFM. So that's a cool chart. I hope you guys dig it. It is in the handout materials if you want a full size version of that. I just thought it was really cool. Uh, if you are interested in more aftermarket parts and modifications, the SEMA show or SEMA organization is a really, really cool, uh, you know, way to check that out. Trucks, imports, muscle cars, doesn't matter, American, Japanese, German, all those. Uh, really, really cool stuff. Draws over 60,000 attendees annually, over 2,400 exhibitors, and 3,000 new products, tools, and components, you know, every year. The reason I added this is because we're talking about modifications, and these guys are a huge advocate for, you know, the aftermarket uh, automotive industry. So all those companies that you love, you know, that make aftermarket cool stuff, whoever that is, are probably a part of SEMA. So you should, you know, just make sure you support them so that they still build that stuff and that uh, they actually are a lobbyist uh, as well, you know, for allowing us to modify cars. Otherwise, the government would say, you know, put a padlock on the hood and don't touch it. 
So these guys uh, keep us able to modify cars in a lot of ways. So just thought I'd throw that out there. Now for some fun. Do <laughs> if I still got anybody? Uh, if I still got anybody online with me? Oh, Jer uh, Jeremiah Foy says bank pressure equalizing H or X. That's actually uh, that's a long-standing debate. If you watch Engine Masters with uh, David Freiberger and and those guys and Steve Dulcich, uh, the X pipe I think uh, made the most power uh, in their testing, but the H pipe had a slight torque advantage. So I think it really comes down to packaging. Uh, I think the the conclusion uh, was that the H pipe didn't give up enough power to uh, to worry about how hard it is to package an H or an X pipe. Rather, you can package an H pipe really easily. It's really tough to package an X. So while it made a little bit more power, I don't think it's enough to uh, to deal with the packaging problems. And if it's a full on, you know, 100% race car, it's probably going to be neither. Uh, but for a street car, I think H pipe is is acceptable, even if it does give it a little bit of power up. Especially if you got, you know, take transmission out of it or something, you don't want to deal with that X pipe all the time. But if you're building it, I guess you could make it easy to get out. So uh, if you're running, if you're running duels in that picture, it was duels. Yeah. Well, I mean, why do you got to have the H or the X? Well, that's what he's talking about, and uh, I can just run straight. Yeah, and I can go back here. So in this picture, actually, uh, they don't run. I uh, don't think that's an X. It might be. Uh, but they do with the with the factory. So there's a couple reasons for it. There's resonance tuning. You know, it equalizes the pulse left to right. Uh, there can be some uh, noise reduction. You know, because of that also. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with with resonance with pressure equalization on both sides. Yeah. Um, there's some science to it, and I'm not exactly 100% up on it. But basically, it says that if you get equalized pressure on both pipes, then it will flow better. But again. Yeah, the X-Pipe sounds meaner. The X-Pipe does sound meaner. i got to hand it to you, uh, especially on a, on a Fox Body. <laughs> Fox Body 5 liter with X-Pipe and Flowmasters, that sounds really good. <laughs> but I do encourage you guys to check out Engine Masters uh, with, with David Freiberger and Steve Dulcich. Uh, they do the exact test that you guys are talking about. So I can't remember the results right off the top of my head, but I think I got that right. If I didn't, I apologize. You guys will let me know. But check that out. It's a really cool episode. Now for some fun. <laughs> Modification fails. So we talked in the beginning of this a lot about why we modify and what we modify, right? And a lot of the why we modify is to add safety, performance, or reliability. Would you say that any safety, performance, or reliability had been added to this car? <laughs> I would say no. Um, so this is, this is one of those things where, you know, just like we, we said earlier about, you know, the power of Christ modifying our hearts and modifying our lives, uh, not all modifications are good. We can be modified the other way as well. So we need to be really careful that we don't let someone else uh, make that modification to our heart uh, or to our life because we'll end up like the person version of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... <laughs> no, and nobody wants to be that. Uh, so modification fails. So we need to ask ourselves when we're talking about modifying, are we adding safety? Are we adding performance? Are we adding reliability? And I've got some pictures here that, you know, I think will offend everyone equally. <laughs> so the first one, ha, any, probably no safety, no performance, and no reliability have been added to this truck. Uh, in fact, I would say quite the opposite. And this isn't an, even an extreme case of one, but I had to include it because, you know, I guess I'm too old. I don't get it. But regardless, uh, what does it do to the transmission fluid, you know, and the, and the gasoline and all that has to, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, I'm sure no safety, performance, or reliability were added to this truck. Now, okay, now I've heard that if trucks, if they, if they go in to get inspected, they won't pass inspection. Because of the suspension modification. Well, I'm not. I'm yeah, not. An, yeah, the headlights are angry. Yeah, I was just gonna say I'm not a. Uh, I'm not an inspector in North Carolina, but I was an inspector in Virginia for a very long time. Virginia, you can't, yeah, and I was gonna say, and, and it would be very impossible probably to get that passed in Virginia because of the headlight angle, because of the altered suspension laws that they had in the, at least the part of Virginia that I'm from. Uh, I haven't run into it here in Carolina as far from an inspection standpoint, but I would imagine that they have very strict headlight angle laws that these probably don't adhere to. Um, 
but you know that's just uh, I, we're we're equal opportunity offenders here. So we got got one for the Honda guys too. <laughs> Again, this is an example where no safety and no performance and no reliability were added to this car. Uh, you know, I'm all for a lowered car, you know, praise the lowered and all, but, uh, <laughs> but this, uh, this is a little ridiculous. This is kind of the car version of that truck. Uh, so like I said, you need to ask yourself, did it add safety? Did it add reliability or did it add performance? And I would say no, uh, under all cases, uh, in this particular instance. And then of course the ubiquitous, uh, donk that, you know, seems to be, <laughs> seems to be everywhere. Uh, I'm not just picking on the, you know, one type of car here, but, uh, again, you have to ask yourself, is that thing safer than it was when it left the factory? Uh, I would, I would very much say probably not. So, uh, yeah, you need to just ask yourself, did we add safety? Did we add performance? Did we, did, did we add reliability? Now, on a four wheel drive frame, I think that, that might be more Yeah, no, I mean, you know, if you put it on a K5 Blazer chassis or whatever and put big knobby tires on it, it would still not be cool but it would be it would be better than that <laughs> uh so guys uh it looks like we had a pretty good turnout online tonight uh and you know all you guys online i appreciate you i love you and i definitely want you to uh to stick around and come out and see us in person sometimes because it's a uh, it's a lot easier to talk to you face to face than it is online but i'm glad that you guys joined in uh <laughs> he says this could be perfect depending on how high the water is that's fair. We do live in Kinston, so, you know, that's, that's probably not a bad thing to be prepared for. <laughs> uh, but that's all I got for tonight, man. If you guys got some questions or comments, please don't, uh, you know, don't hesitate to throw them up there even after the video ends. Uh, I'll check them, you know, later on. I'll put a link to the YouTube channel where these get posted to, and I'll put a link up to any handout materials for tonight as well. So let's close in prayer, and, uh, and we can call it, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you today thankful, thankful again for this time we get to spend together. I know I've said it once already, Father, but I do appreciate this opportunity. And Father, I'm thankful for, uh, for anybody that, that's watching online right now who may watch this later. And Father, thank you especially for the folks that came out here in person. And, uh, and we pray safety over them on the, as they travel home. And we pray that safety throughout this week as you be with each and every family that may be touched by this. And Father, just uh, I pray that somebody may gain something from this, Father, and that you would uh, continue to use me in, as you see fit. And it's in Jesus' name that we do this. Amen and amen. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you again. See if I can get this thing turned off here. Uh, appreciate you. And let's do that. And then that.